Welcome back to another Friday on the Damage Report. I am Ray Vaughn of filling in for John Idarola, and we have some great stories for you today, as well as our Garbage People of the Week, which we'll get to at the very, very end. So make sure to stick around to hear that. But we're going to talk about updates on Trump's many, many indictments, the big, big indictments and some mm -hmm. updates there. We're going to talk about Peter Navarro, who's a character in the Trump Cinematic Universe you may have forgotten about, but <laughs> what's going on with him. Um, we're gonna talk about potential changes to uh, custody rights in California that protect the LGBTQ community, which is fantastic. So all of that and more, and joining me to discuss all of this is Maz Jobrani. Maz, thank you so much for being with me this Friday. Thank you for having me, Ravana. If you guys hear any growling or barking, that's not me. That's my dog, and she's <laughs> down there. So, hi, good to be here. <laughs> she's excited about the show. <laughs> she's on air. She really gets, you know, before the show starts, it's like, I don't know if you, you know, like back in the day when that little red light would go on and say, you're being recorded. She has that, which she's being recorded. She's like, oh my God, the world is watching me. So, she's <laughs> really excited. Well, maybe my cat will do what she tends to do and sit on top of my keyboard and then we'll have a double pet appearance on today's show. I'm in, I'm in. All right, well, let's get started. Let's just jump right into this first story and talk to you about what's going on in Trump's indictments. Because apparently, potentially, justice will not be televised. And that is all depending on whether or not Donald Trump gets his way. Now, in a similar fashion to some of his co-conspirators, I'm sure you've all been keeping up with the updates on Mark Meadows, trying to remove his case to federal court. Trump is also making that same argument. And Reuters reported on this and they wrote that federal court could be more favorable for Donald Trump because he would face a more politically diverse jury pool than in Fulton County, a Democratic stronghold. A federal trial would also allow him to argue that he is immune from prosecution for actions he took as part of his official duties as president because apparently trying to overturn the Democratic results of election is part of your presidential duties. Such a move, however, would still involve a trial prosecuted by Willis under Georgia state law. We've also talked about on the show that one of the other benefits that he gets is he might receive a judge that's more favorable towards him, potentially a Trump appointed judge. But we'll get more into that as that develops. Now, US District Judge Steve Jones is expected to rule on the petitions to move the matter into federal courts this coming week. From that Reuters report, a bid by Trump to move his case could compound legal complications that already threaten the prosecution's lofty goal of trying all 19 defendants as soon as next month. Judge Scott McAfee on Wednesday granted a request by former Trump lawyers Kenneth Cheesebro. I'm sorry, every time I read that name, it trips <laughs> me up a little bit. Cheesebro and Cindy Powell to be tried on October 23rd, though he has yet to decide whether the other defendants will join them. Now, Trump's wider legal troubles are going to create further scheduling issues as he faces potential trials next year. In three other criminal cases, we have from WAPO a little chart mapping out all of the different trials. We could pull that up, thank you. So Maz, one thing that gets me is the way that the Republicans have been trying to frame, because we'll see on the chart, it says that the, the federal January 6th case is scheduled to start the day before Super Tuesday. And Republicans love to say that this is potentially undermining democracy, which is the most ironic argument they could be making by saying that they're gonna be sullying the, the voters before right before Super Tuesday, which is a funny argument to me because unless you know Nikki Haley comes in with a steel chair, it seems like the Republican nominee nation's already been decided for Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, it's all, uh, you know, I said it once uh, before and I'll say it again. And people keep saying that his, uh, that the court cases are going to interfere with his campaigning schedule. I say that his campaigning schedule is gonna interfere with his court cases because He's got a lot of court cases, <laughs> and and now that they're trying to take that other one to the federal court, you would think that one of the excuses not to take it is like, oh no, you already got one in federal. You don't need another. Like you've already got one. Um, I mean, this guy's so slimy, and his lawyers and and the whole team. Obviously, you want to defend yourself and come up with any kind of defense you can to uh, put it into your favor. And yeah, I've been hearing a lot about how if it goes to federal, the idea is that. Possibly the jury pool is gonna be wider and there'll be more Republicans that will be on the jury and maybe vote in his favor. But at this point, I'm so, I mean, I be I gotta be honest with you. I'm so shocked that we're in this world right now where this guy is still out of prison 
and this guy has not been shunned, at least he should be exiled somewhere. After January 6th, I thought Republicans, Democrats, everybody saw with their own eyes and realized that this, this guy's a criminal. It's, it's you know, the, the, the proof, how, how many other ways you need to prove it? We got the phone call, we've got texts, we've got emails, we've got so much information and so much evidence that this guy is guilty and yet he keeps trying to slime his way into another moment of being the road runner and us being Wile E. Coyote. It's time to just stop this dude and and really put him where he needs to be. He really is a, a dangerous detriment to this country, to democracy and all of the above. So, and, and as you said, it doesn't affect his running because these whoever it is that supports him continues to support him. It's it blows my mind. People say, "Oh, Joe Biden is old. But Donald Trump is old." Um, and also, he's old. He's an old criminal. He's an old criminal who is a who's a fascist who wants to rule by his way. So I don't understand these people that support him, but pretty much he's already the guy. So we may as well just get rid of the other guys and and then just have you know maybe that'll expedite his court cases. If we go, listen, you don't have to be on um, on on the campaign anymore. Just go to your court cases and we'll see you election day. Right and. You know, every word that comes out of Trump's mouth is a lie, except for the one time he told the truth was when he said, I could shoot someone on in the middle of Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose a single vote. And I think just because as you highlighted all this irrefutable evidence that he did what he's been accused of has been made available to the public and he's still winning the nomination by miles and miles and it's mortifying. But what else is mortifying is, and you mentioned the jury pool and it's, it's limitations because of you know and how it might be more beneficial for him to move to federal because it creates the possibility that more Republicans might be weighing in. But DA Fani Willis has been highlighting and fighting for more protections for the potential juror pool because of confidentiality issues that we saw come up Particular, the particularly that we saw come up in the um, when it came to the grand jury indictment. But CNN reported on this, and they wrote, and Fani Willis said, based on the doxing of Fulton County grand jurors and the Fulton County District Attorney, it is clearly foreseeable that trial jurors will likely be doxed should their names be made available to the public. If that were to happen, the effect on jurors' ability to decide the issues before them impartially and without influence would undoubtedly be placed in jeopardy. Both placing them in physical danger and materially affecting all of the defendant's constitutional right to a fair and impartial jury. And there, she's already under immense stress. She has a severely limited jury pool because I was thinking about this before. You know, you don't have to not know who Donald Trump is to be able to weigh in on a jury, but you have to be able to do it impartially. I wouldn't be able to do that. I don't think that I could ever be selected to serve on a jury in a trial like this because I couldn't be impartial. I think that he should have been locked up a long time ago. There's no way I could say even having gone to law school, being familiar with the law, I could not sit on that jury and be impartial. And he's an intensely polarizing figure. So she's already working with very slim pickings. And um, and let's pull up this next graphic because as we saw what happened with the grand jury, Trump supporters post names and addresses of Georgia grand jurors online. And I said this before, but I'll say it again. The only reason to do that is to incite violence against them. There is no valid reason for these conspiracy websites to be publishing this information except for to incite violence against the members of the, that grand jury. But also DA Fani Willis herself. So <laughs> she's, uh, she's also been uh, dealing with threats against her and racist attacks against her. And she's also been having to deal with attacks against her from Jim Jordan of all people. Because as you might all remember, he's decided to investigate the investigation <laughs> into indicting Donald Trump. And she firmly rebuked him this week. She wrote this, your job description as a legislator does not include criminal law enforcement, nor does it include supervising a specific criminal trial because you believe that doing so will promote your partisan political objectives. Your letter makes clear that you lack a basic understanding of the law, get his ass. It's practice and the ethical obligations of attorneys generally and prosecutors specifically, she continued on. Uh, that while settled constitutional law permits her to ignore your unjustified and illegal intrusion into an open state criminal prosecution, 
she would reply to some parts of his original letter. Willis also states that if people want to avoid felony charges in Fulton County, such as violation of the state's racketeering or legal RICO laws, then they should not commit those felonies. <laughs> Willis also listed a number of suggestions for productive activity by the Judiciary Committee, among them that Congress should increase federal grant funds to test untested rape kits, of which there are hundreds of thousands in this country, by the way, and expand a program for children who are in trouble with the criminal justice system. Finally, she said that because Jordan seems to have a personal interest in her office, you should consider directing the US DOJ to investigate the racist threats that have come to my staff and me because of this investigation. One of the reasons she talked about federal funding is because Jim Jordan is leading the call to rebuke federal funding from DA Fawny Willis and from Fulton County and from Georgia more generally. But all I can really say about that letter is that she ate and left no crumbs, Moz. <laughs> yeah, Rayvon, a couple of things. First of all, you were talking about the jurors. You know, I am always surprised. I travel the country as a comedian and there are times when I'm talking to somebody about someone who's very prominent and that, and the person I'm talking to goes, "Oh, I have no idea who you're talking about." In politics, for example. So I was actually, in, I was in, I was in Colorado, and I mentioned Lauren Boebert, and the the person I was talking to was very smart, but she goes, "I don't, I don't follow out. Who is she?" And I was like, "Oh wow, there are some people that really don't." want to follow politics, you're right that there's not gonna be anyone who's gonna be like, I've never heard of Trump. But there might be somebody who goes, yeah, I heard about that and I'm not quite sure. And those are the types of people, I guess, that they want on the jury so that the person comes in impartial. And clearly, all you gotta do is play the the, the audio tape with Rapsenberger and be like, oh yeah, oh well, he clearly is asking for votes. <laughs> it's just so stupid. And at the same time, what's crazy is I feel like we are playing a game and the person on the other side is clearly cheated, cheating. You know, like when siblings are playing and the one sibling is just cheating and we're the sibling looking to our dad going, dad, did he's, <laughs> and the dad's like, just keep playing, dad, but dad. And that's the doxing, that's all this other stuff that keeps coming up. It almost feels like every time we go after the guy, there's other crimes that start getting committed. I mean, how many more law enforcement and prosecutors are we gonna need to now go after these people who are doxing these people and threatening their lives, as you said. So it's it's just ludicrous. They The guy should be behind bars, all, all of them should be behind bars. And we, I think a majority of the country would agree that we want law and order, that we want a system that we can believe in, we should all play in a fair system. And these people are not, and they continue to get crazier and crazier. And going to Jim Jordan, you know, I love that Fonnie Willis said you clearly don't have an understanding of the law. And I had to look up to see if Jim Jordan is a lawyer. And I looked it up, he did go to law school, Capital University Law School. And it says that the US News and World Report listed Capital's doctor lawyer program, quote, Ranked not published in 2018, but in 2022, it was ranked as tied for number 147 to 193 out of 197 schools. <laughs> so that tells you a lot about the school he went to. Jim Jordan is an idiot. And he should be he should be somewhere. You know, it's funny, Jim Jordan was a wrestling coach, and you know, clearly he's got his own scandal there. Lauren Boebert was, a, I'm sorry, a Marjorie Taylor Greene was a CrossFit trainer. I feel like we've brought all the meatheads into Congress and they're acting like meatheads. Huh, what a surprise. Right, and I was, when you said that law school, I was like, I've never heard of that school before in my life. So it makes perfectly yeah. sense that it has been consistently unranked. But no, you're exactly right about the meatheads. And I mean, and what was, what is Trump? I mean, not, not in an athletic sense, but just a, Walking, talking idiot. <laughs> Never know what he's saying. I mean, and just to that point, before we get into this next topic about how these are being funded, the defenses are being funded. I mean, it's a different case, but Trump is literally recorded saying, "Look at these documents. I could have, I could have unclassified them when I was president. Now I can't. I could have done it then, and now I can't." And who is he telling that to? Kid Rock. And it's just. It's like the dumbest people ever have put their their heads together to do crime in the dumbest way possible, and I'll be damned if they get away with it because they they're doing their crimes on camera, they're doing their crimes recorded on audio. It's the same thing with the January Sixers. Republicans love committing crimes while live streaming them committing their crimes. <sighs> It feels like a miracle that we ever catch anyone, given the given the length of time that this has taken, and given the the continuous way that they keep 
dodging and extending and delaying. It feels like a miracle that anyone ever gets convicted of anything. But I guess that's a good thing that we gotta fully prove the the crime. But in this case, it's just so obvious. I mean, when you have video, when you have audio, when you have text, when you have everyone, it's just it's mind blowing. And and what happens like if you know if if Mark Meadows were to were to flip. They would they would have an excuse for that. Well, he's clearly trying to save himself. So and so, it's just it's frustrating. I mean, listen, there's been a lot of great days ever since that first great day of when he lost and and they they announced Biden as the winner. There's been a lot of great days. Indictment days have been fun. Um, I just I just can't wait till uh, orange jumpsuit day. I think that would be a really beautiful day. Right, I thought I thought I was gonna get more out of mugshot day. Didn't really do it for me. Jumpsuit day, I think. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if people weren't celebrating in the streets. Honestly, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was surprised. Like even I live in Chicago, and on election day when they or the next day when they announced Biden won, I people were outside just like it was November. It's cold here. They were just partying outside <laughs> like it was yeah. a holiday or something. It was awesome. <laughs> Because they didn't have to deal with this crazy numb nut idiot. You know, every day I would tell I always tell people, even if you like the guy, he was on Twitter every day, just bombarding us with just crap every day. And and that's just the silly part of it. And don't even get me started with all the serious stuff that he that he that he mumbled and jumbled and and you know whether it was you know negotiating with the Taliban in Afghanistan, whether it was his mishandling of coronavirus, whether it was his attempt to get Ukraine to come up with with dirt on Biden. I mean, there was just so much of the immigration, the kids in cages, the 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 the, the Muslim ban. So many you forget. You see, he's done so much stuff. You forget all the other really harmful stuff he did to this country. He really was a bad, bad person and a bad, bad president. Um, and uh, and I, God, I mean, it's like we need some more. Is it is it Schadenfreude? We need more Schadenfreude. <laughs> I'll say, especially because you know we do forget he's done so many horrible things that it's like, oh yeah, I forgot that he did that horrible thing. And some of the mo- most like horrible things that he did were quiet. Honestly, I worked in immigration law during the Trump administration and at the beginning of the Biden administration. The way that he restructured the Department of Homeland Security completely destroyed all of the back end way that we handle asylum cases. So it's just so many things that it's like that wasn't even a big story, but it's just completely destroyed our country. And I think we do need some moments of joy. So let's get into this next section of the story about (laughs) Trump is just running out of money because I love that. The very, very rich president, billionaire man is running out of money. And so much so that now he's just, he's raising money and he's been getting a lot of criticism for not helping to fund the defenses of his co-conspirators, now co-defendants in the Georgia case. So what he's doing to raise money for them now is hosting a family style campaign the light dinner with his two sons at Mar-a-Lago to help pay the bills for his co-defendants and witnesses. New Republic reported that while the details of the event are still being worked out, it is expected to raise somewhere between $500,000 and 1 million, which in legal defense terms, I just wanna say is not that much money. For the Patriot Legal Defense Fund, a fund set up to pay the legal bills of others implicated across Trump's four indictments. The dinner will be held in one of the resort's private dining rooms where the table can seat about two dozen attendees. It's a family style dinner, very intimate and exclusive, ew, said one Trump official. And you know, if you're a, a who's who again in the Trump cinematic universe, then you already know that this happened yesterday. President Donald J. Trump invites you to an evening in support of America's mayor. Rudolph Giuliani, <laughs> that was last night that happened. Um, apparently to raise money for Giuliani, who we all know has has hit financial hard times while trying to defend all of his numerous lawsuits that he's been implicated in and his criminal uh, case that he's been implicated in because of his defense of Donald Trump. But 
Apparently he's not the only person running out of money because let's pull up this headline from USA Today. Trump is running out of others people, other people's money to pay lawyers. Save America PAC is almost broken from that article. It reads, white collar criminal defense attorneys who spoke to USA Today estimated his legal bills will total millions, if not tens of millions. Trump's main account that pays for legal fees, Save America, doesn't have that kind of money. It has spent almost all of the 154.6 million it raised since the 2020 election and had 3.7 million in the bank at the end of June. And Moz, it's funny because again, first of all, the fact that he's having other people pay for his loss, his legal fees when he's bragged publicly time and time again about how rich he is, how he doesn't think about money, but now he's actually gonna have to dip into his own finances to start paying for his legal fees. Well, first of all, I'm always entertained at how these groups that are fascists and they are anti-American, they always come up with the most um, patriotic names, Patriot Defense Fund. <laughs> it really, it's like it's like terrorist defense fund because they were terrorists. The people who people who attacked the Capitol that day were terrorists. They weren't patriots, but they called them patriots. Patriots go home. Now we've got the Patriot Defense Fund. The invite was basically the Budweiser. Uh, logo with Donald Trump's name on it. I'm surprised they used Budweiser because I thought they were they were boycotting Budweiser. Um, people get together to raise money to fight cancer, uh, to help with education, to help those in need. This guy is raising money. Basically, it's the Joker raising money for the Penguin, <laughs> and and it's just it's just so so. Sad and 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 I mean he's doing GoFundMe's is what he's doing. He's 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 totally shameless. This guy, it's like me going, it's like me showing up and going like, hey guys, I'm world famous comedian. I'm the best comedian ever. I'm the most best best greatest comedian, most money making comedian ever. Click here to donate because I'm I need I need money to pay for my transportation to my next show. But I'm the best, most famous, most popular. That's what he does. And these idiots sit there and they go, okay, I'll click here for the, here's $50, here's my last $50. Or you have, by the way, we all know that that there's a big base of hardcore religious, you know, your, your, uh, um, your uh, um, what are they called? The, uh, um, the, 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 not Christian right, but the, the, I wanna say not the fundamentalist, the- uh, Evangelical? Uh, Evangelicals, there's a lot of, listen, there's gonna be some wealthy evangelicals and some other wealthy religious folks who believe that this guy somehow was handed to us by God. And they say, you know, you know, it's been written that he'll come and he'll do this. And oh, he moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. He's doing all the stuff that the Bible has said. Oh, look, he got rid of abortion. Oh, look, he's doing all the good stuff. So they'll show up and give him some of their money. But again, those people are crazy too. So anyone who is rational and somewhere in the middle, you don't have to be far right or far left, just in the middle, should sit there and see this stupidity and this hypocrisy and do not donate to this guy. It's your heart, you worked for this money. Don't give him your money, God, at least don't give him your money. <laughs> It wouldn't surprise me at all if someone who believes in the divine right of Trump <laughs> to rule America is willing to decide over their entire paycheck. But I couldn't agree more. Yeah, please don't give him your hard earned money. He doesn't need it. He should be able to fund his own way. You voted for him because he was rich, let him use his own money. Okay, we have to go to a break, but stick around because we'll be right back with some updates on Peter Navarro. I'm gonna finish reading that comment because I was so rudely interrupted by the transition screen. <laughs> Although I knew that it was coming because I definitely had a countdown. <laughs> I said, I'm so crazy, I just dropped most of my ice cream sandwich into my coffee. Delicious, why not? You dunk donuts into coffee, why not dunk your ice cream sandwich into your coffee too? <laughs> okay, with that, let's move on to this next story and let's all watch this. I said from the beginning, this is going to the Supreme Court. I said from the beginning, I am willing to go to prison, to settle this issue. I'm willing to do that, but I also know that the likelihood of me going to prison is relatively small because we are right on this issue. That's a guy who's definitely going to prison. <laughs> now, it's a good thing because apparently he said he's willing to do it. Um, but if you're wondering why he's 
definitely going to prison. It's because he was just convicted of contempt of Congress during the January 6th investigation. And he did say that he's gonna take it all the way to the Supreme Court. I'll add from my perspective, from my legal knowledge, there's no way on God's green earth that any appeal this man makes is going all the way to the Supreme Court. And I would assume he knows that. But NBC News reported on his conviction, so let's get into some of the facts of this. The jury deliberated for about four hours at a federal courthouse in Washington before it found Navarro guilty of two counts of contempt for refusing to testify before the House January 6th committee and turn over subpoenaed documents. Each count carries a minimum of 30 days and a maximum of one year in prison, in addition to a maximum fine of $100,000. And the article continues on. The verdict came after a four hour jury deliberation after it was read. Defense attorney Stanley Woodward moved for a mistrial saying that the jurors had taken an outdoor break near where protesters and media regularly gather outside the courthouse. And came back with a verdict shortly after. Judge Amit Mehta did not immediately rule, but said he would consider written arguments on the issue, which is pretty standard process. Now, the prosecutors argued that Navarro acted as if he were above the law, which he absolutely did when he defied a subpoena for documents and a deposition from the White House January 6th committee. Now, (laughs) Peter Navarro's attorney, Stanley Woodward's arguments have been making me laugh since I was getting into them this morning. Um, But he said that the uh, government had failed to prove Navarro was guilty of criminal contempt of Congress, despite the fact that there was a subpoena and he didn't go, that there was a request for documents, he didn't request them. But NBC News reported uh, of Woodward's words, for the government to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, it also has to prove that Dr. Navarro's failure to comply with the subpoena was not the result of accident, mistake or inadvertence. Woodward said, stressing the final three words repeatedly. The case is about those three words, he said, adding that the government had failed to tell jurors where Navarro was when he was supposed to have appeared for his deposition with the January 6th committee. And I really love this response. On rebuttal, prosecutor John Crabb said, who cares where he was? (laughs) <laughs> what matters is where he wasn't, which is also, it's so funny to me that Woodward is highlighting that it couldn't have been a mistake, accident or inadvertence because they didn't argue. And he says, highlighting those three words, they didn't argue that it was an accident or mistake or inadvertence. They argued that he didn't have to comply with the subpoena. So focusing on those three words is entirely irrelevant to the argument that they were making to the jury. And and just to that point, Navarro said he didn't appear because Trump told him not to do it and to assert executive privilege. And the funniest thing to me is that Navarro could have gone. He could have gone to the deposition and asserted, attempted at least, which I don't think that there's any actual legal standing for him to do so, but he could have attempted to assert executive privilege in person, and maybe he wouldn't have been, <laughs> he wouldn't have been indicted and then convicted of contempt of Congress. But he didn't do that. He just didn't show up. But of course, Donald Trump had to had to post this on his social media site, Truth Social, and Peter Navarro's defense. He wrote, I can't believe that these fascist monsters capitalized for no reason have so viciously gone after the great Peter Navarro for defying the totally partisan January 6th unselect committee of political hacks and thugs refused to go after crazy Nancy Pelosi. And the reasons she and the mayor of DC rejected 10,000 soldiers, which would have easily stopped any future security problem. His testimony wouldn't have mattered anyway because the committee quickly and illegally deleted and destroyed all evidence and findings. God, who knows what the hell that man is talking about at any given moment. But Peter Navarro joined his friend Steve Bannon, who should be also in jail right now, by the way, because he He was sentenced to four months in prison back in October for the exact same charges. He should have still still been in prison for what Trump pardoned him for doing. But I guess that's neither here nor there. Peter Navarro was you know, expectedly upset about what happened. Let's watch. I was not tried for contempt of Congress today. That's not what the trial was about. If any of you sat in the trial, you saw the opening argument. You saw the opening argument of John Crabb, the attorney for the prosecution. He didn't argue, he spent, he didn't argue the case on contempt. He said that I was responsible for the J6 insurrection. 
which is totally, totally without fact, without fact. So you probably noticed the protesters behind him holding up signs. There's some pro-Trump protesters, a lot of anti-Trump protesters. Um, and some of the protesters have been trolling Peter Navarro during his press conferences. So let's watch this next video. Here we are with one of the most important constitutional separation of powers issues. And people will not let me speak. This is my First Amendment right. This is what I'm going to do now uh, is allow. Um, There's cameras here. The marshals just saw you. The marshals just saw you. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You just assaulted me. That man just assaulted me. He stuck a flagpole in between my legs. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. So she's not the only one because Peter DeVar has been doing press conferences throughout the trial. And there's always been protesters behind him trying to distract him from what he's saying. And it's been exceptionally effective. Maz, what do you make of all of this? Oh, God. I mean, Peter Navarro is a clown. Um, this These guys make my job as a comedian easy because you just show the clips. I mean, that. Those protesters are hilarious. One of them was behind him the other day, and every time he spoke, they keep blowing a, blowing a whistle. <laughs> that was so funny. I mean, people gotta look it up. It's so fun and funny. Um, first of all, going back to Trump's post on Truth Social, you know, they used to say that Trump is Q, and when you read that post, he clearly is Q. He has become Q because that one post that he posted had like three or four conspiracy ideas all rolled up into one thing. And he is now speaking to his crazy. Because if you if you're if you're on Truth Social, you you've you you've you've drank the Kool Aid, and so they're they're reading that and going like, oh yeah, the January sixth committee destroyed the evidence, and then the the, the unselect committee and and uh, Nancy Pelosi would have had ten thousand soldiers, and she said, I mean, it's all wacky, wacky, wacky stuff. So that's him. Uh, Peter Navarro is listen. I I've I think I once got a ticket for jaywalking, and the process that for me to go and then have to pay the ticket and stuff was like a month or two. wasn't much more. Navarro defied this uh, um, this this subpoena to go speak in front of Congress. It's been so January sixth committee was at least a year ago, maybe even more. And as you pointed out, Steve Bannon as well. And I don't know what takes so long to get these guys and have them serve their time. You did a crime, you should serve the time. If you really are a law and order person, if you're a Republican who believes in law and order, you know what? I committed a crime, I'll do the time. That's the thing is not one of these people who are involved with this conspiracy to overthrow democracy have admitted guilt. Not one of them has come through and been like, you know what? I messed up. I got I got caught up in this guy's crazy cuckoo ideas with him and Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell and Johnny Smith. All the crazies got together and they came up with a crazy idea and it sounded good on that day. But you know what? I was wrong. I'm an American. I believe in America. I believe in law and order. I believe in democracy. And therefore, I will admit my guilt. They haven't. The, you know, Mark Meadows. This guy Navarro, all the other 19 code defend, all of these people continue to claim that they did they did everything by the book. It was just freedom of speech. I was just talking. Navarro, it was executive privilege. No, it wasn't. It wasn't executive privilege. And as you said, he could have gone and sat there in front of the January 6th committee and just even either given vague answers or given no answers, like some of these people did, and and moved on with his life. And by the way, if you're not guilty. You show up and you testify and you tell them everything that happened and you tell them the truth. If I did not commit a crime, I would, if I'm really so proud of the fact that that day I was um, uh, uh, pra practicing my right as an American to question the election, everything was by the book. I would show up in front of the January 6th committee, I'd be like, yes, Trump told me to call the electors and tell them to be ready in case we win the court case, yes. Trump told me to call the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and get them ready just in case. But it was all legal. It was all legal. So they claimed they didn't do anything illegal, and then they don't want to talk about it. So which one is it? Was it legal or illegal? You tell me. You tell me, Peter Navarro, with your slick back hair. You're really stupid for a guy who's supposed to be Dr. Navarro, Dr. Seuss. I did love that his attorney re referred to him as Dr. Navarro every time. Obviously, trying to be like, "Oh, come on, this guy's 
Dr. Navarro, he could never have committed a crime knowingly. He's too smart. He's doctor, Dr. Navarro. Yeah. Also say for any protesters in the future, if you ever want to make sure that these people's press conferences can't be reposted on social media or even played on some news, loudly bring speakers and play copyrighted music because that's one surefire way to make sure that their words are not republished and you don't let them, you know, get to spin the narrative in terms more favorable to themselves. Marjorie Taylor Greene came out and said, we played the sound yesterday, that she's like, I'm not voting for any budget bill, no continuing resolution, nothing that doesn't involve the defunding of Jack Smith's special counsel office and everything that he's doing. Do you feel similarly about that issue as you do to defunding the FBI and the ATF and the DEA, et cetera? So, so George, when, when I was uh, teaching uh, law school, um, I learned and, and taught certain constitutional principles. When Marjorie Taylor Greene was teaching CrossFit, she learned a whole different set of values, evidently, because um, my idea of what this country should be like is based on the Constitution. And she sees the world differently. When you've got people who care more about their social media accounts than they do about the Constitution, we have a real problem in Congress. He got her ass there, credit where credit is due. But I don't wanna give too much credit to that person because that's Representative Buck, who is not criticizing Marjorie Taylor Greene because she's a crazy far right winger. In fact, he's criticizing her as one of the most conservative lawmakers in our Congress. He's criticizing her because he's a member of the House Freedom Caucus, which as you all know, has been publicly beefing with Marjorie Taylor Greene since it kicked her out. Uh, for quite some time now, um, but she's again publicly beefing with them. So she posted this on Twitter. She wrote, I'm appalled at this factually wrong and completely out of touch letter written by Freedom Caucus member Representative Ken Buck about the treatment of January 6 defendants. First off, Mr. Buck passed the buck, very clever there, sitting member of Congress, by the way, on voting to object on January 6, 2021 and certified Joe Biden's election, so we know. Um, let's just start there, that Marjorie Taylor Greene is criticizing this man who just said that she doesn't know anything about the Constitution for actually faithfully executing his constitutional duty to certify the election. She's criticizing him for not violating the Constitution, but she goes on to criticize him for several other things too. Let's pull up this next one. He does not support President Trump, which is the worst thing you can do as a Republican. That is the biggest sin you could commit against their God King Emperor is not supporting Trump sufficiently. Ken Buck has also been vocally against impeachment inquiry on Joe Biden, shockingly completely unwilling to even ask the question in spite of the overwhelming evidence proving Joe Biden has abused his power. Overwhelming evidence that we have not been made privy to, by the way. <laughs> overwhelming evidence that they have yet to shine a light on. Um, <clears throat> But just on that last point about opposing impeaching Biden, he responded to that here. I don't see any reason to start an impeachment inquiry at this point in time when all the power, all the uh, uh, resources that we uh, can muster are now uh, being used to investigate whether Joe Biden received money uh, from Hunter Biden or Hunter Biden's activities or whether he uh, in some way knew about Hunter Biden's activities. But to be clear, sir, at this point, you don't think that evidence has been presented. You're still waiting to see that evidence. I, I do not think that evidence has been presented. And I don't think there's a need to have an impeachment inquiry when we have three committees that are doing great mm -hmm. work developing the kind of evidence that would lead to an impeachment inquiry. I just saw someone in the, the damage report chat referred to Marjorie Taylor Greene as the vanilla gorilla and it just took me right out of the <laughs> story. But Maz, it's crazy that like the worst thing you can do as a Republican, like I said, is is really just go against Trump and not follow their completely nonsensical political charade that they're creating. Yeah, first of all, going back to what I said earlier about these names they give themselves, the Patriot Defense Fund, the Freedom Caucus, they're the least free uh, um, supporting group of people, they want fascism. They want to take away your right to choose uh, whether you want or don't want to have an abortion. They want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, hold the 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 economy hostage in order to get their agenda 
moved forward. They, they, the Freedom Caucus, for the most part, supports Donald Trump and wanted him to remain president, even though he'd lost the election, which is the definition of fascism. They wanted to basically um, get rid of the de democratic norms and keep their guy in. But they call themselves the Freedom Caucus. So let's start with that. Um, as you said, uh, this guy, Buck, is not the best guy either. But his takedown was great. Uh, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, she really, it goes again back to what I said before. She does not have an understanding of of the law, and yet she just spews all this stuff. The fact that she wanted Ken Buck to vote against the uh, approval of the election shows you that she doesn't understand the law. The fact that she wants Ken Buck to come up and support this thing with the Joe Biden impeachment. Again, we have no facts. These people just throw stuff out. All they gotta do is put one doubt in the minds of their followers or constituents, and then it just spirals. And it's, um, it's just it's a crazy crazy place we're in and and it's uh it's uh, you know marge should be he's right marge should be teaching when she was if she were a crossfit influencer and saying this stuff i'd be like oh she's just another QAnon person but she's one of the 435 people that we could choose out of 330 million people this is the best we could do which is really really sad and and again the last thing that you said to your point these people have a hard time if you go against Trump, a Republican that goes against Trump is a Republican on their way out, which is sad in itself. How could that not be, that should be the number one thing. They should all agree like they did the day after on January 7th, they all agreed. Lindsey Graham said, I'm done, I'm done. And they can't be done because they're being held hostage by their cuckoo and they're going along and the they're being wagged by the dog, wag, wagged by the dog. Right, and particularly concerning with Marjorie Taylor Greene is that she's cozied herself up to the Republican leadership and cemented a role for herself in the Republican Party for quite some time moving forward. So although we probably won't be able to vote her out of Congress because she lives in like a, a R plus 6,000 district, you know, at least we can go and we can vote to make sure that her voice in Congress has as little say as is possible. Um, God, okay, with that, we're, we gotta go to this next break, but stick around because after this, we're gonna talk about uh, the Danny Masterson trial and we've got some other oh. stories. A judge sentenced that 70s show actor Danny Masterson to 30 years in prison to life yesterday. The maximum sentence that he could have possibly received for raping two women. Masterson's first trial for three counts of rape ended in a mistrial in December. But after prosecutors retried two of those counts, he was found guilty in May. Now, the two victims were at the courthouse for his sentencing and they gave the following statement. So let's start with this first statement that says, when you rape me, you stole from me, said one woman who Masterson was convicted of raping in 2003. That's what rape is, a theft of the spirit. You are pathetic, disturbed, and completely violent, she said. The world is better off with you in prison. And the a statement from the other woman says, the other woman Masterson was found guilty of raping said he has not shown an ounce of remorse for the pain he caused, she told the judge. I knew he belonged behind bars for the safety of all the women he came into contact with. I am so sorry and I'm so upset. I wish I'd reported him sooner to the police. Although one of the victims did report him in 2004 and it didn't result in any investigation or any trial at the time. But thankfully when it was reopened earlier, in 2017 that he event that now he is eventually being brought to justice. Now Masterson has maintained his innocence, something that the judge highlighted as the judge handed down the sentence. The judge said this, I know you're that you're sitting here steadfast in your claims of innocence and thus no doubt feeling victimized by a justice system that has failed you. Olmita, who is the judge told Masterson before handing down the sentence, but Mr. Masterson, you are not the victim here. Your actions 20 years ago took away another person's voice and choice. One way or another, you will have to come to terms with your prior actions and their consequences. And he'll have plenty of time in prison to sit there and think about his actions and their consequences. Although without any remorse that he's feeling now, I don't know if he'll you know, come to terms with the fact that he is where he's going to be for the next 30 years because of the actions that he did and potentially longer than 30 years. Now, Masterson is a prominent member of the Church of Scientology, 
The church is also involved in this because they've been accused of covering up his crimes and having knowledge of his crimes. Now, all three of his victims were also members of the Church of Scientology. AP reported that at the sentencing hearing, one of the women who, like Masterson, was born into the church said she was shunned and ostracized for going to authorities in 2004. I lost everything. I lost my religion. I lost my ability to contact anyone I'd known or loved my entire life. She said, I didn't exist outside the Scientology world. I had to start my life all over at 29. It seemed the world I knew didn't want me to live. And you know, a lot of people, when they think of Scientology, one of the people they think of is Leah Ramini, who was actually at the trial. She's a prominent anti-Scientologist activist after escaping Scientology. She put a statement out to her Twitter, which reads in part, over the past seven decades, former Scientologists have sadly become used to Scientology using its financial resources, religious protection, and relationships to snatch justice away from them. For over two decades, Danny Masterson avoided accountability for his crimes. While Danny was the only one sentenced, his conviction and sentence are indictments against Scientology, its operatives, and its criminal leader, David Miscavige. And Maz, a lot of people were surprised after the first trial ended in a mistrial and the involvement to which Scientology has had in this case and in the trial and in their defense of Danny Masterson, you know, that that he was found guilty and now that he has been sentenced the maximum sentence. And a lot of people are saying it feels like a, a shift in in the, you know, in the culture because so often these crimes are committed by these prominent members of the Church of Scientology and they just get away with it. So it's, you know, in a continuation of, of the Me Too movement, but also in you know, in the movement against Scientology, it feels like a big victory. Yeah, I mean, this is just tragic. Any way you look at it, from top to bottom. I mean, first of all, the victims. I mean, like she said, you you don't just you don't just get over the trauma. It's not like oh, now that he's been convicted, oh great, all is good. Let me move on with my life. The trauma lives on with you the rest of your life. And um, it's just tragic that that this happened. Um, it's tragic that you know we all knew Danny Masterson as this fun guy from the show, and you know that it's tragic that this person that you thought was one thing is completely different. Um, and then, as you said, with the Church of Scientology and all these organizations, I mean, it's, it reminds me of the Catholic Church with all the issues of the priests. Um, it seems like all these institutions try to defend themselves. As opposed to um, uh, self-investigating and getting rid of those who commit crimes, and so yes, I hope that it's a shift in the culture. Um, I, I'm not holding my breath because I know that quite often these these organizations have a lot of money. They're very wealthy. They're not going to admit their guilt. They're not going to admit that they are adding to this culture. Um, and and but I do hope that as generations move forward, I mean it's a slow progress, but as I hope as generations move forward, we continue to call these things out and earlier and earlier um, and believe the victims when they say something. You know, I have a daughter, you know, I, I would I would hope that, you know, God forbid if she ever told me anything happened to her, I would want to start by believing her first and then investigating um, because uh, here we are, you know, these these poor victims. She said she tried to say something early on, and everyone turned against her. Which is just, I mean, that's it, 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 you know, from this side, it seems so obvious that you should definitely have investigated and believed her back then. But knowing that this organization like Church of Scientology or other organizations like the Catholic Church are so insulated and they're so protective. I can see how those people that are in there would have said, no, no, don't rock the boat. We'll figure it out. We'll slap his hand. And here we are with lives ruined years later. So um, I hope it's a shift in the culture. Right, especially with organizations like Scientology that have the financial resources to just demonize and the media connections to demonize, you know, the the victims in these cases who are trying to come forward, who are trying to speak out. It's the same way that we see them react to people who leave the Church of Scientology and then speak out against the practices of Scientology and you know the unfair labor practices, the abuse, the sexual abuse, the violence against women. You know, they they spend all of this money and all these resources trying to smear them in the media. And I mean, it took 20 years for these women to to finally get you know, any sort of justice out of the situation. And I just hope that, you know, that amount of time continues to shrink and people are able to get justice sooner and sooner. 
Okay, that is all the time we have for the first part, but we have more on the aftermath coming up. So if you're on linear, switch over to YouTube, Twitch, or head over to our website to catch the aftermath and see our garbage people of the week. And I'm on tour, people should come see me live on tour. Absolutely, all right, we'll see everybody else in the aftermath. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.